Good morning. Those of you that have been here for the, the last hour will already have got a flavor about uh, manufacturing challenges that the industry is facing and I'll be focusing on um, autologous cell therapy um, manufacturing challenges in particular. Um, it's my role at Lanza, I had the autologous business um, there, so uh, it's what I think about every day. And uh, just a brief disclaimer, we're publicly traded, so I have to make you aware of uh, all the constraints. But uh, briefly an introduction to um, our business. And uh, so the autologous cell therapy business is part of the Emerging Technologies Business Unit at Lanza. We're a large CMO, so we manufacture all kinds of modalities, but within the Emerging Technologies Business Unit, we focus on um, cell and gene therapy. So we have uh, six sites across three continents, and I will go into why um, we think this is important. Um, we manufacture cells, part of my business, but also viral vectors and a combination of the two. So gene therapies um, using uh, ex vivo and in vivo um, technologies. Uh, as part of our services, we also um, offer process development, essay development, and thus uh, take you from, or can help you take you from uh, concept all the way through clinical manufacturing and then going commercial. So the six sites that I mentioned, uh, three of those are here in the US, and uh, some of you may have heard that we just opened the uh, world's largest, currently the world's largest, cell and gene th uh, therapy manufacturing facility in the world in Houston. Um, we also have sites in Warpsville and Portsmouth, um, and we expanded into Europe last year uh, by the acquisition of Pharmacell, and are now um, on the ground in the Netherlands, supplying the European market, as well as uh, our collaboration with uh, Nikon um, for, the, for the Asian market. So, it's a global footprint, and uh, the reason for the global footprint is obviously that this market is uh, very active, very uh, international, with over 500 companies at the moment, um, 1,300 products in clinical development and a massive growth. Um, so the key focus is in the US, hence uh, our presence here in the US. But also Europe is growing, and uh, Asia with China and Japan uh, being key markets. At Lonzo, we usually focused on, on kind of large bulk manufacturing, it's what we know how to do. Um, and uh, when I joined the company two and a half years ago, we did a market assessment and uh, we had to come to, re to the realization that not only is the market in, in general growing, but also autologous and patient-specific cell therapies are uh, now almost half of the market. So it, it was um, an important part of the market that we didn't really address up until then. But uh, based on these facts, I uh, decided to um, make a strategic decision and, and, and start investing in that market and also serving it. So obviously, the autologous cell therapy is um, mainly dictated by the immune uh, cell therapy space, um, in particular CAR T's. And uh, as you may all be aware, last year was uh, quite an important market. Not only did it shift uh, over to autologous being the, the, the key technology and the, the key therapies uh, in the market, but also we had some key commercial uh, achievements that uh, I'm sure you've all heard of. So all of these uh, last year were mainly uh, dominated by blood cancers, so liquid cancers easily addressable. But as of yesterday, um, we actually had the first success in solid tumors. Um, so this may sound like a fairly innocuous nature medicine paper, but uh, it's actually, there's, there's full remission in, in a breast cancer case um, using adoptive immune therapy approaches by the NCI. So I think uh, with this news and uh, hopefully further uh, coming down the line, I think this market is, is uh, here to stay and definitely here to grow. So from a manufacturing perspective, obviously, this uh, puts us into a position that we uh, need to address because we have uh, patient-specific therapies, so we manufacture one dose per patient, um, which means that not only can we not, out, uh, not upscale, we need to outscale, um, but also more patients means more batches, more work, more assessments, more analysis, um, and ultimately more money. So it's it's very complex and hence um, 
some of the effects that I will uh, introduce you to now from a complexity perspective, but also how we think we can address them. So, when we did the market assessment, we also did uh, kind of a process assessment and, and a fact assessment, and uh, we used a run-of-the-mill, in this case, CAR-T process, and just looked at what, what are the, the different steps that we need to take, and then did the calculations on what does it take uh, to actually serve 20,000 patients a year. And if we're looking at solid tumors and yesterday's news, then 20,000 patients a year is probably uh, the bottom end of, of what we're facing. So an average process still takes about two weeks um, and you need to do unit operation and, and manipulations about every other day. So if you average that out across uh, a full year and there's 20,000 patients, it means that you need to, on average, start 55 processes a day, and that is assuming that you can schedule them regularly every day and not uh, you only have a blood sample taken on Mondays and, and all of the complexities around that. It also means that you need to, on average, harvest uh, 55 batches a day, and then you have 770 processes uh, ongoing on any given day. So this is a lot of processes, they're very small, and you need to segregate one from the other in order to avoid contamination. So there's, there's all of these complexities around it. So if you then say that you have to do something every other day, um, it means that you have about 500 discrete actions that you need to conduct every single day just to supply a market of 20,000 patients. So obviously that has severe implications or very high implications, not only on cost because you have to have the facility, um, the space that comes with this facility, but also the manpower to actually carry out those actions, um, the relevant instruments that you need, uh, the logistics of getting samples from the hospitals to a manufacturing facility and back, and also the cleaning and sterility um, aspects that you need to consider um, in order to avoid contaminations. Um, and also cross-contamination from patient to patient. So, and all of this, obviously, in front of um, the fact that you're dealing with uh, very, very sick patients that, uh, at this point, have already undergone a lot of treatments, and this is kind of still their last hope. So obviously, we're hoping that this will become first-line treatment and not the third-line treatments that we're dealing with um, at the moment. And so, from a manufacturing perspective, we then looked into how can we actually make this work? What are the, the steps that we can take to um, simplify the process, but also take away a lot of the, the risk factors in the space, manpower, and, and uh, equipment um, perspective? So, this is the, the process that I detailed um, with my calculations. Um, so you, this, this doesn't take into consideration the work that happens at the hospital, clearly. So there's, there's a lot of upstream and downstream uh, activities that happen at the hospital, which comes with a whole set of uh, complications and uh, training needs at the hospital. This is only the manufacturing part. So you have incoming documentation when you receive it. You need to ensure that this particular sample, because it's autologous, it is patient-specific, is documented in the right way so that once it goes back, it goes back to the right patient, right? So key activity is documentation, and there's probably nothing that at, at this point that we can do in order to simplify that other than barcoding and scanning and, and uh, um, using a lot of IT backbone to, to try and make this as streamlined as possible. Subsequently, whole blood separation, again, this is, this is mainly uh, with regards to immune therapies, um, then cell seeding activation and transduction for gene-modified cell therapies. Um, you have expansion where you have, have a lot of feeding steps and then uh, washing the usual process monitoring to ensure that, uh, that, that your cells are still doing what they're supposed to do. In some cases, you have selection and then you have the whole harvesting and release testing. So everything that I have underlaid green here are the steps that we think we can automate by bringing in a, an, an automated um, GMP in a box approach, and I'll get into that in a second. But if you average out the hours that are required if you don't automate, you come up with about 60 hours um, of individual uh, steps and, and, and manual interventions that you, need to, um, that you need to invest in order to manufacture one dose. So the ones that I underlay green are the ones that I have now, in this calculation, um, put with a zero, because I think if we automate those, um, as well as have a lot of um, informatics um, 
brought into into play to automate and, and, and collect information. I think we can break it down to about a third. And uh, this is the reason why we partnered uh, with a small company out of Canada called Octane Biotech. And uh, so the system that they have developed is called Cocoon. It's a, as I mentioned, it's a GMP in a box um, approach where all of the steps that I underlaid uh, in green, so cell seeding, expansion, and harvesting, um, as the kind of high level steps, are automated in this system. So in, in an ideal world, you put everything into the system at the, on day one, once you receive it from the hospital. You press a button, you go away, and you harvest it at the end. Of course, there's a lot of um, testing that still needs to go on, which at this point is not automated. But at least the, the, the key steps we think uh, we, we can accommodate by, by just having a system that is fully closed and, and, uh, and automated. And not only that, obviously we have the space efficiency that we we're trying to accomplish, where at the moment we have one clean room per patient in order to ensure that we're not cross-contaminating and, and uh, bringing in samples from other patients. Um, with a system like this and a stackable setup, um, we think that uh, we can really reduce footprint um, and also make the facility a lot more efficient. So from a numbers perspective, I think labor we can reduce depending on the process and the length of the process, the complexity of the process, down to 30, by 30 or 50 percent even. Um, from a space perspective, due to the 3D setup, um, we can go down all the way to 80 uh, percent in, in the fully ideal setup. Um, but also, if you have a closed system like this, which is fully controlled, you can reduce uh, the, the facility maintenance, um, which also uh, brings down price on, on just running costs, on your own everyday running cost. In short, automation may be one step uh, towards enabling these, these therapies. Um, I think there's uh, still a lot of work that needs to be done on the analytical side. So we always call out to our friends in, in, on the biotech and, and analytical um, industry side to come up with new rapid testing sensors, things like that, in order to, once the cells come out at the other end, you have a green light and you can go straight back into the patient. Um, and I think decentralization ultimately will be another key factor. Um, enabled through automation so that you, you can replicate manufacturing at different sites in a more decentralized way. Um, so from, from that perspective, we think uh, the Cocoon is, is uh, one approach. And I'll invite you to our booth, it's just over there. If you look over, we have a, a system at the, uh, at the booth, so uh, you can get a demo and, and get some hands-on time with it and see how it works. So with that, thank you very much. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions.